Okay, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Safwan Masri, Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our audience from all over the world and our two speakers, Brian Dot and Kaiser Koo. Uh, the Global Centers are in nine cities around the world and we are very delighted to be uh, bringing you these very important webinars and especially this series, um, which today's webinar is part of, and that is a book series that's titled In Conversation With. It's a joint production with our partner, Columbia University Press. Uh, the series was launched to give our global audience an opportunity to listen to and engage with scholars and academics from a variety of perspectives as they discuss the latest books and research. The partner in the series, Columbia University Press, is an old soul. It was founded in 1893, and it is one of America's longest running university presses. It publishes, translates, and distributes books in an array of disciplines and professional programs. We'll be speaking today with author Brian Dot about his new book, The Chili Pepper in China, a cultural biography. It will be a feast for the ears, and I can't wait for us to dig in. One of the joys of my work with Columbia University and of my life, indeed, has been traveling and experiencing cultures from all over the world, something I look forward to returning to uh, once our world uh, comes back, comes out of the crisis we're in. Uh, this includes naturally trying various cuisines and learning the stories and history behind different dishes, uh, including many of those in Asia. So with us now to take us on a journey through time and palate is with author Brian Dot is Kaiser Ku, who will introduce Brian more fully. But by way of introduction of Kaiser, he is host of the Sinica podcast, a weekly current affairs podcast that has run since 2010. A native of New York, he lived in China for 20 years, and he has worked as a journalist and as director of international communications for China's leading search engine, Baidu. I understand that Kaiser's personal culinary skills include sourdough bread baking, Sichuan cooking, and making the perfect Sazerac. Before I turn it over to Kaiser, a bit of housekeeping to our audience, please feel free to post a question through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. In the last portion of our webinar, we will try to get to and offer as many of the questions as possible. We'd love it if you could include the country where you are now located. This webinar will also be available on demand and as a podcast, and we will post it to our website and you'll receive a link a day or two after the webinar ends. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Kaiser, and thank you, Brian. Over to you, Kaiser. Thank you so much, Safwan, and thanks to all our friends at Columbia University Press and at Columbia Global Centers. Uh, thanks especially to Meredith for helping to set this up. <clears throat> so welcome to this special live streaming recording of the Seneca Podcast, a weekly discussion of current affairs in China. The Seneca podcast is produced in partnership with SubChina. SubChina is the best way to keep on top of all the latest news from China through our daily email newsletter, our website, our app, and our growing range of videos and podcasts. It's a feast of business, political, and cultural news about a nation that is reshaping the world. I'm Kaiser Guo, coming to you today from my home in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Over the last five months, like many of you, I have spent a lot more time than before in the kitchen there are basically three cuisines that I cook in regular rotation, Chinese and especially Sichuan cuisine, Mexican, honoring my roots growing up in Tucson, Arizona, actually, and Indian, which I just, I think it accounts for most of my weight gain. Um, and all of them are, are tied together by one ingredient in particular, and that, of course, is the chili pepper. I am an unapologetic chili head, as anyone who knows me can attest. Uh, my family buys enormous restaurant-sized bags of, of 
chilies. We buy gallon jugs of pisian chili bean paste, uh, dobanjiang. We make our own red oil, our, our own hongyo. We use dried chilies. We use fresh chilies. We use preserved chilies, green chilies, anchos, gojillos, red chili, uh, cashmere chilies, uh, chipotles, you name it. Uh, you, you get the idea. And so when Columbia University Press reached out about interviewing Brian Dot, uh, author of a new book on the history of the chili pepper in China, I naturally jumped at the opportunity. Uh, well, the day has finally arrived. Brian Dot is professor of history and Middle Eastern studies at Whitman College, and he's the author of The Chili Pepper in China, a cultural biography, which was just published in May. Brian, welcome to Seneca, and congrats on the book. Thank you, Kaiser. It's great to be here. So, Brian, what initially got you interested in studying the chili pepper in China to the point where you were willing to just spend what must have been thousands and thousands of hours just pouring over arcane gazetteers and pharmacopias and shipping inventories and bills of lading, uh, centuries-old recipe books and, and more? You must have been pretty possessed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was basic, somewhat serendipitous. So I knew you know, in the back of my mind that the chili pepper is native to the Americas. So it had to have been introduced into China. And I was eating at a Sichuan restaurant in Beijing and thinking, well, how did the Chinese start eating something this different, this intense? Mm. So if you look, you know, sort of prior to the 20th century, cuisine typically is, was a fairly conservative part of a culture and didn't tend to change drastically. But the introduction of the chili pepper is a pretty drastic change. It's got a pretty intense flavor and that heat as well. Um, so that's what just piqued my curiosity. How did they start eating it? And then how did it spread once it was there? So you set out to answer a couple of you know pretty central questions. And they're, they're basically, well, how did it enter China and, well, uh, and when? So let's start with those two. I mean, there were other sure. others, of course, but after all this research, you must have a pretty good idea. Can you summarize what it was that you, you just decided and the evidence for what you came sure, to believe? Sure, sure. Um, so the chili doesn't go anywhere outside of the Americas until Columbus. Um, he probably brought it back, not on his first voyage, but his second voyage back to Spain. Mm -hmm. So it's probably in Spain in 1494. Um, the Spanish at that point were not thrilled with eating it. Um, <laughs> and the main place it crops up there is in monastery gardens as a decorative plant. Uh. Um, the Portuguese start moving it around Africa and into the Indian Ocean Basin. Um, they bring it into Goa in India. So one of the initial names for the chili in India is the Goan pepper. Um, and then from there, it works its way into Southeast Asia. Um, and then from the other direction, eventually the Spanish set up uh, their trade across the Pacific and they start moving stuff primarily from the Mexican Pacific port of Acapulco and then they sailed across to the Philippines and eventually all of those, the so-called Manila galleons are going to Manila. So we have the Chile then in Southeast Asia from those two different directions. And then it gets a little hazier. Um, I was really hoping when I started the project that I could figure out, you know, like within five years or 10 years when it actually arrived in China but the records aren't that precise. So it's probably, it's gonna be coming from somewhere in Southeast Asia, Malacca or Manila being the most likely places. And probably it's Fujian merchants who are doing a lot of trading in that area. Um, we're talking, this would be the late, mid to late 1500s. Um, are probably the ones that brought it but it's not, it's very likely that they brought it just as a flavoring on board for their food. And then when those people got on shore, they'd bring some of the seeds with them and plant them. 
Um, and that's true probably also for the Manila galleons coming across from Mexico. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the chili pepper and one of the reasons it's really all over the world is it will grow in a wide range of climates. Right. Um, so it'll grow in a temperate climate. And this is a contrast with all those spices like that Columbus was trying to get to. Um, <laughs> black pepper, nutmeg, um, allspice, uh, cloves. They all require a subtropical tropical, yeah. to tropical climate. Um, and therefore, most of the world has to continually import them. And so if you're studying that trade, like Kaiser had mentioned at the beginning, you can look at ship manifests and bills of lading and you can tell, oh, they put in 40 crates of cloves and 20 crates of black pepper on their ship somewhere in Indonesia and then sailed it back to Europe. Um, but there's no evidence that chili pepper was ever a trade commodity until we get into the 20th century. Wow. Um, so can, can you corroborate then, I mean, I think you, you, you ended up deciding that it were, there were sort of three spots in which it, it made landfall in China, um, and those correspond to, well, three different names. Can sure. you go into that? I mean, I think the, yeah. the, like the, the, the foreign pepper, the fanjiao, and then the mm -hmm. fanjiang, the, what is that, the yeah. foreign ginger. And, and, mm -hmm. and so just to be clear, the, the earliest written record for China for the chili pepper is 1591. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's less than a hundred years for it to get from the Americas to China. And probably it was there a little bit earlier. That's just when it first get, got written about. Right. Um, so it enters the first place we know it enters is actually the central coastal area of China, um, modern day Shanghai area. Shanghai wasn't much of anything at that point. Um, so the first author lived in Hangzhou. Um, and he named it uh, Fanjiao, so foreign pepper. So he was very cognizant of the fact that it was coming from abroad. And so that's clearly the earliest first entry point. Um, now, if we go further north, um, sort of near the Korean border, um, the chili pepper was introduced into Korea um, during the Japanese invasions in the 1590s mm -hmm. and it takes off very quickly and then it spreads I figure probably sort of farmer to farmer through northern Korea and then into um, basically Manchuria, uh, Liaodong area of China. Um, and there it's a different name. They name it Qinjiao. Um, which was no end of confusion for me during my research because Qinjiao is means the pepper from Qin, which is the old Chinese state that first unified China. But that's and, in the Wei River Valley. Right. Uh, and, and that's all the way out west, you know, right. sort of so, south of the Ordos. Right. Yeah, modern day Shanxi. Yeah. Um, and so that name of a pepper from Qin is actually the Sichuan pepper or Hua Jiao and pepper native to China. But interestingly, we use the word pepper and the Chinese use the, the term Jiao for black pepper, Sichuan pepper or flower pepper and chili pepper. They're three completely different plant families. Right. Um, so the other name that happens um, is in Taiwan. Um, and there we've got uh, fanjiang, which is foreign ginger. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the thing I think that for these different, some of the different names is means that they're using them in ways similar to ginger in Taiwan, similar to the flower pepper or Sichuan pepper up in the north, northern China. And then also fan the foreign pepper, in that case, the pepper term is a reference to the flower pepper, Sichuan pepper as well. So hmm. I think an, some of the initial use and the popularity of chili comes about as a substitution for other flavorings. It's interesting that, that um, even today there are names uh, for chili products, for example, hai jiao mian, uh, which means sea pepper 
uh, mian, sea pepper, you know, uh, flour, whatever you want to call it, ground, mm -hmm. you know, it's ground, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that, that definitely connotes its foreign origins as well, or that it comes from the coast. Uh, and yet there were a lot, there still are a lot of Chinese people who to this day are very surprised to find that it has its origins in the Colombian exchange, uh, which is really interesting. I'm, I'm curious, Brian, I mean, if you, if reading your book, you know, uh, it, it almost feels like it's, it's aimed at, at a couple of audiences. There are parts that, that, you know, absolutely riveted, right. Uh, as somebody who's just sort of a foodie, as somebody who's just interested in, in food history. And there are other parts that are, quite esoteric where you get really into uh some some serious academic stuff who did you actually intend the book for uh i mean weren't you kind of tempted maybe to strip that all out and do another version with a you know a, a, a popular trade press that yeah. is just aimed at the food um i mean this was a, the writing process for this book took me quite a while um and i rewrote it i don't know how many different times and uh, you know, coming out of academia and my first book was very academic. I started with a very academic focus and it wasn't working for me. Um, and so throughout the various rewrites, it got a more popular audience, but be probably mostly because I started with that. And then also I, as a historian, I, I can't let go of footnotes. Um, <laughs> I, I need them. Um, so I think it's, it's, you know, it ends up being a little bit of a compromise in the sense that I started from that very academic focus, but then through the writing process decided I really wanted to get a broader audience. And then actually the, all the different editors at uh, Columbia University Press were really helpful for me in, in trying to get rid of some more of my jargon and, and open it up to a broader audience. Um, but I think the main reason it's not just that popular focus is because I started from that more academic. Right, right. There's, there's only also, so much. You can... <laughs> for me, there's, there's, um, I'm not as good at that level of writing as the academic, but I can, I can find a balance between the two. Well, we're going going to, you know, satisfy all that popular curiosity today on the show. Uh, and let's start, I mean, we, we always talk about the Sichuan pepper or the hua jiao. And uh, let, let's, as you said, you know, hu jiao, hua jiao, and la jiao, we all use the same, you know, word. And it, it's scientifically correct. These are three totally different species. Uh, just for, in case there are people listening to this who aren't familiar with the hua jiao, the Sichuan pepper, uh, can you quickly describe it? I mean, it's a member of the citrus family, is that correct? And it's related right, to yeah. the prickly so it's ash. In the prickly ash family, um, it's uh, small and round, very much the same size as a black pepper corn. Right. Um, it's the seed pod shell. So as it opens up, there's a black seed inside that's usually not used in the cuisine, but can, can be in there. Um, and so it's that, that just a very thin, about two half sphere shells that are usually attached to a tiny bit of a twig. And that's what gives it the name flower pepper. It looks sort of like a flower if you have right. the little twig with the two parts. Or sometimes you can get as many as four of them on one twig. And it really looks like a flower. It has um, a very characteristic taste and flavor. And, yes. And uh, a physical property. Right. So it's got... Uh, strong pungent flavor, but it's not as intense as the chili pepper, um, perhaps a little less intense even than the black pepper. But its other characteristic is very unique and it has a numbing characteristic. It actually numbs your tongue and lips. And some people like to joke that the reason the Sichuanese love it so much is because it allows them to eat more chili peppers. <laughs> it numbs things down a little bit. I found uh, that, that that particular flavor also uh, accentuates salinity. It makes salt taste saltier too, which I, I've always suspected was part of the reason for its popularity is that you could stretch salt. You could make something very expensive like salt go a much longer way with it. Mm -hmm. um, hua jiao and, and la jiao, and let's, let's speak only about la jiao, about uh, chili peppers here. That has risen to the level of becoming what you call 
and identity food. Uh, I'm curious what makes a particular food an identity food for an ethnic group or, or a region. I mean, we can certainly think of others. I mean, paella, right? Uh, gumbo, uh, bagels, right? There are uh, mm -hmm. foods that have a particular association with a place that had become almost a, a totem, a, a fetish item for people. And you can't <laughs> visit this place without eating it. You know, you can't go to New York and not try New York, you know, pizza, uh, whatever. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. But, but like you, I mean, I've run into lots of Chinese people who have no idea that, that they're, uh, or, you know, Sichuanese and Hunanese people uh, who, for whom their identity food, uh, they believe it to be indigenous. They, they're mm -hmm. completely surprised. I mean, there are actually, you know, lots of, I was thinking about this, uh, food items from the Colombian exchange that have uh, risen to the level of, of kind of a, an identity food as well. I mean, we could probably name some, um, I mean, like, uh, the tomato in, in Southern Italy, for sure. Uh, the potato in Ireland, uh, uh, chocolate in a couple of European countries in Switzerland and in Belgium, right? Mm -hmm. uh, none of these things were, you know, pre-Columbian. Uh, so what, what is it? I mean, what, what makes a food an identity food? Um, I think it, you know, it's something that probably becomes used almost on a daily basis in the cuisine and it's something that's going to be in the it, I think it's important that it crosses class lines um, it's going to be used in the it may start in the more popular or it may start in the more elite but it works its way either up or down um, and becomes sort of throughout the society um, something that's used. And then, of course, I suspect it's helpful. Um, I mean, we can think a little bit. I mean, it's not completely something that all those cultures can grow themselves. The ch right. chocolate would be the, the main exception there. Um, the Irish, obviously, are growing the potatoes. The Italians are growing the tomatoes. The Chinese are growing the chilies. Um, so, you know, those ones may be a little more powerful than... Uh, in the sense that those are being used daily. Um, and so the, I think it's helpful that they can grow them themselves. Um, typically, if you're importing something, it, it's gonna raise the price pretty dramatically, which means you're gonna be cutting out the lower classes from it. So it has right. that accessibility for lower classes as well. And then it just becomes, I know over time it becomes ingrained and people will associate it um, you know, um, with their home cooking, with going home. And so even, you know, a lot of countries end up with regional cuisine. So within right. Italy, there's different regions. And of course, absolutely in China, um, that if you're from Sichuan and you travel somewhere else, especially if you're, you know, say the 18th century, 19th century, you might not have access to those chili peppers. And they'll be one of those real longings and remembering um, back yeah. to the home cooking and, and that food taste can be a really strong trigger for memory. And Just ask Proust, that, right. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'm curious, though. I mean, I wonder if there are Irishmen who don't know that the potato isn't indigenous to the Emerald Isle. I mean, if there are. Huh. Yeah, I yeah, don't know. I mean, I that'd mean, be, that would be interesting to know. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, so I guess a lot of people are probably wondering what the hell was Sichuan food like before the Colombian Exchange? They, they had the hua jiao. Yeah, they had the, mm -hmm. the, the Sichuan pepper. Uh, they had, you know, other spices. They had black pepper. But already it had a reputation as being a spicy cuisine. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's going way back, has a, 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 a tradition of strong flavorings in Sichuan. And a lot of scholars think that probably a lot of the reason for that is that uh, it's way far inland, it's really moist in both the summer and the winter. And so you have to figure out different ways of preserving foods. And so, a lot of the ways that they developed tend to impart fairly strong flavorings on the food. 
Um, so pickling, smoking, um, using spices uh, like Sichuan pepper or black pepper or star anise um, as preservatives all really help to impart strong flavorings. And so when the chili pepper arrived, it was coming into a culture that already had that tradition of strong flavorings. Um, there's also within Chinese traditional medicine an idea that you need, uh, if you live in a climate like that, you need to expel excess moisture from the body. Mm -hmm. And some of those strong pungent flavors are really good at that. Yeah, we call once that sweating. Chili, <laughs> right, sweating, yes, exactly. But once the chili arrives, it becomes the predominant uh, spice for, for accomplishing that medicinal or health value. I can attest to the, the sweating effect of, <laughs> of chili. I don't have it myself, but I know, like my, my brother, my God, when he just, uh, it's it's pretty astonishing. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating. I'm... Uh, I, I, I totally buy this idea that it's, you know, preserving food kind of gets you accustomed to much stronger flavors. I, I, I know that's certainly the case. I, the other night I started preserving lemons, you know, in the Moroccan style mm. and I couldn't wait the 28 days. I was cooking a lot of Moroccan <laughs> style food. So I bought some online and I had been told by a Moroccan friend of mine, a guy named Badr Benjaloun, that they were much stronger in flavor than actual lemons. And I could not believe how in intense the flavor of preserved lemons is. It's, it's, it's like that lemon zest on steroids. It's not mm -hmm, so, yeah, mm -hmm. I, can totally, I can totally see that. that that's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, what did the Chinese word la, which is now, it's hard to translate. It just sort of means spicy, right? right. Uh, yeah. As opposed to hot, um, you know, calorically. Uh, but what did that apply to before the introduction of the chili pepper? Um, so, um, actually, la, maybe you talk about the orthography of the character itself. Sure, which sure. Is kind of interesting, right? So we have the older character for that's often translated into English as pungent, but also could be translated as spicy. Sheen, um, and that character is a main component of the character La. Um, and so that sheen character, um, you go back to some of the really early definitions of it. It's the, the flavor of hard metal. Oh. Um, and you can occasionally, I can, I can occasionally get that when I'm eating uh, pepper or any of those different peppers. Um, and so that's its initial thing and it, and it fits into uh, the Chinese sort of cosmography of five flavors, one of them is seen. Um, and then- That corresponds to metal, presumably. That cor right, yeah, they all exactly. Correspond to one of the <laughs> they co five, correspond five. to one of the elements or the phases and the metal element, absolutely. Um, so the la prior to the chili pepper is ginger, um, mm -hmm. uh, I can see that garlic, also garlic, right? Um, and I've, you know, in my time visiting China, I've had people describe both of those as la, but nowadays, really, most of the time when people are using that term la, they're really referring to the spiciness of the chili pepper. Right. Uh, Although, I mean, I, I still use it for, for ginger. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, when somebody thinks they're getting a cold, we make up that, you know, the ginger, we cut up a ton of ginger and, and boil it in water uh, with some brown sugar or Coca-Cola in it. And, and, and right, it's, right, yeah. it's la, it, it actually it is, is yeah, la. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I, I've heard even like really heavily carbonated soda described as la. I've heard mm -hmm. uh, a strong whiskey, for example. Uh, yeah, yeah know, that makes lots of sense. Taste, yeah, makes la. Uh, la. There's it's, actually yeah. references, particularly in a Korean source, of using chili peppers in alcohol, I think as a means of cutting, you know, passing off lower, lower uh, value alcohol as, as higher grade alcohol by putting chilies in it. Uh, ah. Interesting concept. <laughs> Great idea. Um, I, you know, you have, there's a couple of theories about uh, the vectors or the agents of the transmission of the chili in China. Uh, one of them 
is sort of that it was merchants. Uh, it was, uh, you know, people sort of, you know, moving this around as a trade good. The other was that it was just taken up by farmers, that it was you know, something that people planted on the windowsill gardens and things like that. And, and, you know, mm-hmm. possibly decorative, but it, 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 it spread that way. You fall on one side of this debate and I think it's really interesting because it opens up a whole uh, discussion about class and right. the chili pepper, yeah. but let's start with that merchants versus sure. farmers. Um, so one of the issues is and why we can have these fairly divergent interpretations is that the sources are, are very incomplete. Um, and so you, you can't, you know, there's not, Surpri- not surprisingly, the illiterate farmers aren't writing about their transmission of the chili peppers. Um, but there's also no records of merchants trading large volumes of chilies until we, you know, maybe the very late 19th century, but really not until we get into the 20th century. Um, so it's really sort of a, a more theoretical interpretation of what's going on. Um, so. I fall on the side that I think the the main transmission route would have been peasants or farmers um, passing along some seeds to their neighbors or maybe to the family that their daughter married into. Um, and so it would move slowly through those sorts of networks or they might take some seeds to their local market and just pass them out or trade them. Um, I think this makes a lot of sense because, you know, one of the things I have in terms of looking at some of the lots and lots and lots of different sources is that there are a lot of local names for the chili pepper. I've, yeah, yeah. I've found over 50 different names in Chinese for chili peppers. And, and they don't correspond counting. to different varietals? I mean, those because there are a lot of... The, there are also lots of names for varietals and those are sep- that's a separate list. Right. Um, these are ones that are just used sort of generically for any variety. Um, and so, and a lot of them are really colorful sorts of things that would, are much more something that would occur to a farmer than a scholar in his studio. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's the goat horn pepper, the, chi- the chicken heart pepper, the chicken toe pepper. So these are sort of body parts of animals that they would be seeing on a daily or maybe, you know, monthly basis. Yeah, that's um, a very strong argument in favor of the farmer. Yeah, the so I think there's that. And, and the fact that we don't have records of them being in, in the market and being moved by merchants persuades me that it, it makes a lot of sense that it's that local movement. Um, so a good example is uh, Sichuan. So as we go a transition in, in regimes in the mid 1600s, there's a lot of warfare in Sichuan and a huge, huge loss of population. Yeah. Um, and so the subsequent Qing government actively encouraged in my, you know, migration into Sichuan, a major group of immigrants into Sichuan were Hunanese. And by the time they would have been moving there, they were using the chili pepper. And so it's almost certainly those Hunan migrants who brought the chili to Sichuan. Right. Uh, just for the historical context of that, that was there was this uh, sort of bandit rebel leader named Zhang Xinzhong, who was just a, you know, I mean, he was notorious for having killed probably in the millions of people uh, during the, the interregnum you know, at the end of the Ming Dynasty and leading into the, the, the Manchu takeover. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's fascinating. So that you think that was the, the major rush into Sichuan was just because of these Hunan migrants. So Hunan is right, to the probably, southeast. You know, Hubei also. But, right, uh, Hubei yeah. as well. Right, right. Both of which are also notorious for, for having very spicy food. Um, right. yeah. We were talking a little bit about uh, class divisions. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting that, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it took so very long for the Chiles to actually move into the two provinces we most associate with them, maybe the three. I mean, so Sichuan, Hunan, and Yunnan, uh, quite late. It's really not until the se- mid-17th, uh, century, mid 18th century, that, that they're attested there, right? 
Do you think that it's because these sort of scholar literati types didn't pay attention um, to to this, or do you think that it was just sort of just this slow osmotic process of transmission, you know, across pretty vast territory? I think it's a combination of both. Okay. So I think it's probably it's almost certainly in places prior to it being written about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's got um, to be. And then I do think that you know that slowness also helps support the idea that it's moving farmer to farmer rather than some merchant hauling it under the radar farmers. of any literate person who would have written about it. Right. Exactly. Right. 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 Yeah. So I mean, the, the, again, back to class divisions. I think that's really fascinating because, uh, I mean, the, the chili pepper. You you describe a kind of elite culinary reluctance. I mean, it seems like Mao might have been really onto something when he linked chilies to revolution because, you know, today there is kind of a, a even today, a, a class struggle when it comes to, to chilies. I mean, let's face it, I, I lived in China for a very long time. Uh, the more kind of effete, refined, scholarly types that I was friends with uh, always went in for, you know, the Huainan food or the <laughs> vegetarian <laughs> stuff or, you know, you know, Shanghainese cuisine, stuff that was not, not particularly strong flavored and... and Whereas my earthy, you know, hard drinking rocker friends, uh, they were always up for checking out the, the, the latest, you know, Chuan Sai Guan, the latest Sichuan restaurant, just and, and ordering the, the spiciest possible dishes. I mean, there was a kind of machismo always to eating chili, uh, a kind of, you know, you call it, you link it to hyper masculinity in, in your book at one point. Can you, can you talk about the, that male sure. archetype of it? And then also, the female counterpart to it, which is really also fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, Mao is a good example. I mean, he's from was from Hunan. Yeah. And he absolutely loved chilies. Um, he would sprinkle ground chilies on his watermelon. Um, <laughs> and so, he one point one of his doctors recommended he cut back on chilies and he just ripped into him. He's like, "How if I'm afraid of chilies in my bowl? How am I going to face my enemies?" Um, so he did a very direct correlation between sort of military capability and the ability to eat chilies. Um, and he'd make fun of people who who would come and visit him and they couldn't eat spicy food. Um, oh wow! And so. <laughs> that gets carried over and i mean it's a really common it's probably a little bit apocryphal but it's really really common today for the chinese to say oh yeah mao said that you know without the chili pepper there would not have been a revolution yeah um he said something like that for sure but he was mostly referring to his own he wouldn't be able to if he couldn't eat he wouldn't be able to do revolution and if there weren't chilies in his food he wouldn't be able to eat it uh, what about the uh, the female archetype? The, the female meizu. archetype is is known as la meizu, which is <laughs> spicy girl or spicy young woman. Um, it's a trope that goes back quite a ways, but these days it's it's particularly attributed to women from Hunan, but also from Sichuan, um, and they're seen as because of eating so many chilies throughout their lives it's impacted their personalities and they're seen as being feistier, independent. Um, they'll speak their minds. There's a great song about it, La Meza, um, where, where she takes that gusto out into the world because of her, because she's been eating chilies ever since she was a little girl. So it's feminist. <laughs> That's great. I, it can I think so. It can be. Yeah, yeah, um, okay. There's some earlier manifestations of it where it's not so much, but that's back in the 18th century. Yeah, that's 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 great. Um, and that's a, a topic I think that would be worth like its own book. Um, <laughs> okay, so core question here: What were the factors you you think that ultimately led chilies to gain traction in specific geographies of China? You actually downplay the one that I heard, I've heard most often, which is the environmental explanation. Uh, you think that there's something else going on? I, I mean, I it. think the, um, the medical environmental explanation is stronger than the, you just need a strong flavoring because you're living in a really hot place. Um, so for particularly, you think of like Hunan, Sichuan, uh, Yunnan, Guizhou, they're all inland. They're super humid, both in the summer and in the in in the winter. 
Um, and the people in Guajo particularly emphasize the ability of the Chile to expect, expel excess moisture in the winter time. Um, and so I think that was really, really important for that region, uh, that, uh, that medical or health aspect of chili peppers. Um, yeah, yeah. If you look uh, at, yeah, go ahead. Hey, go ahead, go ahead. So, I mean, speaking of health, I mean, maybe we can quickly move to, uh, I'd love to get the audience questions here uh, as soon as possible. But uh, I mean, what was it used for? Okay, so there's some really medicine? interesting things. So, you know, really important thing that it's used for and this goes back to the idea that it's associated with metal. It's, it's actually really useful for illnesses associated with the lungs. Uh -huh. um, and then it, through experimentation or observation, a lot of Chinese figured out, well, it also is helpful for these other things. Um, it has, a, a, um, you know, it definitely has an antimicrobial characteristic too, the mm -hmm, capsaicin mm -hmm. in chilies. Um, it also is an analgesic, so it helps to reduce pain. Um, so even when inflicting a, it, <laughs> a recipe right for if you get bitten by a snake, you can put a poultice of chilies on the snake bite, and it's supposed to help reduce the swelling and reduce the pain. One of the ones that I find hard to, and you also found hard to understand <laughs> how this would work. I know where you're going. There's there's a a number of sources that say the chili pepper is a miraculous cure for hemorrhoids. Oh, it God. seems super <laughs> counterintuitive. It's really important to realize this is taken through the mouth. Um, well, so, I, I know that it has an effect anyway. When you <laughs> it does have it. an effect. So I don't know. They, they, they claimed it was miraculous so that it worked really, really well. I, I know more than a few hemorrhoids. I have not this. really tried that. Uh, who are, would not go anywhere near a Chongqing hotline. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions for you. Okay, so have you, 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 you saw all these old recipe books. Did you try any of the old recipes in these ancient, you know, pepper-based um, recipes? I mean, in a way I have, but the ones that, I, the oldest ones I have are super vague. So it's like the ingredient list is chili peppers, chicken, soy sauce and oil so yeah i've done that <laughs> but i've done it in a lot of different ways but it's no way to tell if i'm really doing it in the way of the recipe so that's right the they're just terribly imprecise they're, they're very very imprecise yeah 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 that's always how it is with the old i mean these days it's much better these days they're <laughs> i.e actually everyone's got a kitchen scale everyone you know gives the recipes in grams and so it's uh, much better but yeah god i i, I I was hoping that maybe offline you could send me a couple uh, of those recipes. I'd like just for my own experience. I can't. Sure, sure. I'd love that. that would be great. Uh, Brian, I'm going to leave with just a couple of lines of doggerel that I, I uh, wrote a while back that from a, a, something I wrote called provincial poetry. Uh, and I do make specific reference to the chili when I'm talking about, you guessed it, you know, Hunan and Sichuan. So uh, this is just unpardonably bad doggerel. The Hunanese in temperament are piquant as their dishes, like duojiao yutao, capsicum with slow braised heads of fishes. Add to this mix the province's infernal summer heat, and you see why Hunan Xiangjun had the Taiping rebels beat. So again, that military, <laughs> right? Yeah, it yeah. has the military thing. God, I, I was like, you know, you should have interviewed me for your book. <laughs> but <laughs> then the Sichuan, uh, the Sichuan stanza is, the tea houses of Chengdu represent the Sichuan way. The women toil in earnest while the men drink tea and play. The Chuan Ho plays at Mahjong while the Chuan Mei cleans and mends. And like the Sichuan chilies do, she burns it at both ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. You see what I did there? Mm -hmm. yep, right, yep. right, right, right. No reference to the hemorrhoids. Brian <laughs> Dot. Wow, thank you so much, uh, and, and best of luck with the book and all the rest of your scholarly pursuits. As a fellow chili head, I salute you. All right. Thank uh, you, Kaiser. Yeah. And thanks to our friends at Columbia University Press and the Columbia Global Center for putting on this event. Thank you especially to Meredith for setting all of this up and introducing me to Brian. Thank you so much, Safwan Masri, for, for your very kind introduction. Uh, let's move on now to, to Q&A. And, and Safwan, Safwan, why don't you take it, take it from here? Thank you. Thank you, Kaiser. And thank you, Brian. Fascinating. Just incredibly fascinating conversation. And Kaiser, your knowledge... Uh, is just incredibly uh, impressive. And Brian, you know, as a colleague, 
um, I'm very, uh, you know, admiring of uh, how you started with this sort of perhaps uh, targeting an academic audience and you made it uh, so accessible and so interesting for so many people. Uh, so we have a lot of questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And I might lump a few together um, thematically and uh, maybe we can try to uh, address them uh, quickly. So David Shah asks, what's the difference between the Sichuan pepper and chili peppers? You've sort of addressed that, but Christine Owen asks if this is the same as the Sancho pepper in Japan that's dusted over unagi donburi. Uh, did it arrive when Japan invaded uh, Korea, she asks. Javier Roman from Mexico is asking uh, that there are 300 plus varieties of chilies. How many do you find in China? Um, he also later on uh, talks about the trade between Asia through the Philippines and Acapulco. It uh, was a very big event. Chili peppers got to China and in Mexico there's a region, Puebla, where you find a traditional outfit called China Poblana uh, mm -hmm. due to the Chinese influence in its design and the origin of the materials utilized at the time. Uh, and finally, as if that is not enough, uh, Thandi <laughs> Pennant asks, which variety is the hottest in the world? So uh, just to recap, difference with Sichuan, uh, Sancho, Pepper, uh, Mexico and the varieties over there, um, and then uh, sort of, you know, the, the, the hottest um, in the world. <laughs> sure. So the chili peppers and the Salinaceae family, it's the same family as the tomato, the potato, and tobacco. Um, and it is native to the Americas, particularly Central America and Northern South America. Um, the huajiao or Sichuan pepper, it's also known sometimes as Fagara, is in the prickly ash family. So it's a tree um, instead of a short plant. Um, there are some prickly ashes native in the Americas and some um, native groups actually used to chew that seed pod as a relief for toothaches. So that's building on that numbing characteristic. So they're very different plants and the, the Sichuan pepper has that numbing, very distinctive numbing characteristic to it that's quite different from a chili pepper. Mm. Um, I'm not 100% certain for the Japanese one. I'm pretty sure. I mean, they, the Japanese don't eat. It looks like Kaiser knows for sure. Yeah, no, it, it's that's not what it is. Uh, okay. Sancho pepper is, is just a, a, a type of chili pepper, and it's you know, blended that's with other spices. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, not. Yeah. It's okay. not. It's not. Yeah. The the chili the, the Japanese eat some chilies, but not a lot of chilies. Um, the Sichuan pepper is also native in Japan and in Korea. Um, so they both use that as well, but that other one is a, is a variety of a, a chili pepper. Okay. Um, there were a couple others in there. You have to remind me, Safwan. Well, the, the uh, Mexico and uh, Puebla, did you address that? Right, I mean, so... Yeah. The, the trade, of course, is both ways in that those Manila galleons, they're, they're taking American, I mean, one of the main things they're taking from Mexico is silver from Mexico and Peru over to uh, Asia. And, and most of that's ending up in China. Uh, at that point, the Chinese economy was really built on silver. Um, and so but they're taking back all sorts of other things. They're, they're getting silks, they're getting porcelains, um, and they're getting tea, and they're bringing that back. Some of it's staying there in Mexico, but a lot of it's then transshipped back over to Spain. Um, so it's, it's, a huge, it's a really, really important trade network for global exchange, absolutely. Mm. Okay. So there are questions about the medicinal uh, benefits, and I know Kaiser uh, hit on some of that with you, but uh, Diane Baker asks about, you know, the verifiable medicinal benefits of eating pepper, and Jake uh, Gombin Sperling asks, why did the chili take over as the medicinal choice for sweating out toxins? 
<laughs> what was seen as the preferable characteristic over earlier methods of doing that? Um, I think probably the biggest important aspect of it is it's just more the heat of the capsaicin is more intense than than those other spices. And if you just think about it, if you're eating a chili pepper, a really hot, spicy chili pepper, um, that flavor can last in your mouth a lot longer than than say black pepper, which has definitely a shorter period. Um, and so I think it just they felt like it was just more effective at causing that sweating and, and getting rid of excess moisture. Um, it just it just really I mean we can see it um, throughout the 18th and into the 19th centuries. Um, the chili pepper is displacing the Sichuan pepper as both a flavoring and in terms of that medicinal use. Mm -hmm. um, in the early medicinal uses of the chili, there's quite a few of them that are not really used today in traditional Chinese medicine. And I think it's partly because they're seen as perhaps too powerful and overwhelming other ingredients in that medicine. But the one place where they are still a really strong presence in terms of impacting health is in that daily use of them as a means of uh, living in that really moist and humid climate. Got it. So I mean, there are some questions about ethnicity and culture. Uh, so Andrew uh, Berend asks, are peppers associated with ethnic spiciness as well? Um, ethnic spiciness, quote unquote. Uh, you know, are the uh, Sichuanese considered hot-blooded, for instance? What about uh, foreign cultures? Uh, he mentions Hungarians as an example. Uh, but there's also, I mean, another question that's, that's fascinating, and that is, is there a comparable culinary introduction of a food item into another culture's cuisine? And we know that the answer is absolutely yes, right? Uh, but something that is similar to how the chili pepper was introduced in China um, and that basically changes a country's at least culinary uh, trajectory. Um, and, you know, we know of so many, there's so many fables about introductions of foods in other cultures. Kaiser, you mentioned paella earlier on, and uh, I'm in the Middle East, on the Mediterranean, in Jordan right now. And in this part of the world, you know, we're convinced that paella um, was uh, is is the Spanish sort of pronunciation of baia, which is leftovers. Uh, that when the Arabs were there, <laughs> yeah, you know, no, sure, yeah, sure. Some, some, the Umayyad caliphate, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, right. And uh, you know, also a lot of contention in the Eastern Mediterranean. You know, baklava. Where does it come from? Is it Turkish? Is it Greek? Is it uh, Levantine? And yeah, and, falafel is a big one. Hummus yeah. is actually contested. Oh, yeah, right? too, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, there is a lot of appropriation also that that uh, that takes place with these things, and it becomes very political, right? Yeah, um, it becomes uh, highly politicized. So, um, so yeah, what 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 what's what's the what what other things can you think of that are comparable to the introduction of the of the pepper and and you know Andrew's question about the ethnic spiciness? Uh. Sure, I mean, so. Um... I got a couple too. Yeah. yeah, there's in my process of studying the chili pepper, there are some references early on where minority groups in particularly in Guizhou adopting the chili as a substitute for salt, which was quite expensive in Guizhou. Um, mm. So that it's it's sort of it's a combination of class and, and ethnicity that's driving them um, in choosing that. And part of it's because they're, the minority groups in that point had been pushed out of the larger city areas and up into the mountains. So they're further away from the trade networks where salt would have been coming in. And so they're making that primarily an economic decision that's also eventually impacting a difference, the divergence in, in the um, their cuisine versus the people in the cities. Right, right. And then Kaiser, you you add? Yeah, I mean, I, one, one food item I can think of is curry in Japan, right? Um, a lot of people are surprised that when, when we, you know, because curry is so ubiquitous in Japan, 
Japanese curry has a very distinct taste. You can taste that it is related in some way to, you know, the curry from the subcontinent. It was brought there by the British um, in the in the mid 19th century, but um, it's become indigenized to the point where recently there was a big kerfuffle because a Japanese man wanted to actually copyright the recipe for Japanese curry. And there was a big, you know, outroar or outcry over that in, in the Indian community. This, this sort of thing happens all the time. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Kimchi, uh, you know, Chinese say they were making kimchi before the Koreans were, and the Koreans are very upset about that. <laughs> right, right. But neither yeah, of them could have possibly been have been making it before the Columbian Exchange, right? <laughs> well, they, they, the 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 Koreans the claimed they were making it, but it was called white kimchi. Right. Um, yeah, that, so it didn't yeah. have the chilies in it. But obviously right. now it's it's that would be a an, a good identity food. Uh, oh, absolutely. Kimchi for Koreans. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. I mean, I right. think every country we can think of has has one. You know. Yeah. The hamburger. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and, oh, yeah. and you know, Kaiser, you mentioned uh, you mentioned hummus, which is uh, an identity marker and and uh, something that you know it's been part of the cuisine of this uh, region of the world for a very 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 long time. And now you go to a restaurant and there is uh, Israeli hummus, and the question becomes: When did hummus become Israeli or uh, <laughs> you know couscous or things of that sort? Right. Uh, but you know, he, he, here's a question that that I think um, is is you know, I've been thinking about as well is the influence of globalization um, and with increased Chinese overseas uh, tourism. Um, how is that changing the Chinese palate? And the corollary to that is why is Chinese food in China so different than Chinese food outside of China? You know, so for Sure. Somebody who goes to China for the first time and expects <laughs> to find food that's parallel to what you yeah. and I would have in New York um, uh, is shocked that they yeah. that they don't find that, and what they find <laughs> they find very difficult to adjust to. Right. Um, well, I think it's sort of a genius of Chinese restaurateurs that wherever they've gone, they've adapted Chinese food to the local taste, and so. A, you know, South African Chinese restaurant versus a, uh, you know, Midwest U.S. Chinese restaurant versus one in the Netherlands, they're all different. Um, and so that's a lot of what it has to do with it. They, they realize, you know, particularly if they're not in a big metropolitan center where their main audience is overseas Chinese, they need to appeal to the locals. And so they they're very, they've been very, very good at adapting flavoring to entice, you know, in the local people to come to their restaurants. Um, in terms of changes for Chinese uh, cuisine, I think actually probably Chinese domestic tourism has a, probably a bigger impact than Chinese overseas tourism. Um, is a, it's, if you've never been in China, you don't understand the scale of Chinese domestic tourism. It's enormous. Mm. Um, you know, not all the Chinese, a lot of Chinese can't afford to travel overseas. Mm. So they're traveling in China. And, and so one of the things that's done is exposed people who are from places that typically don't eat spicy food. Um, I mean, Northern China, there's some, but it's not as spicy as in Sichuan or Guangzhou is not spicy, that Jiangnan area, uh, Hangzhou, Suzhou area is not spicy. So when people from those places go to Sichuan or Hunan or Hubei or Yunnan, they expect to eat spicy food and they're going to eat spicy food and some of them really like it. And so we also get a big growth of especially Sichuan restaurants all over China. Um, mm-hmm. And they become really popular. And I was talking a little bit with Kaiser about this, that I have friends, and I'm pretty sure he does, where the younger generation tends to, is much more willing to eat spicy food than their parents. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And now you see peppers actually making their way into cocktail drinks, right? And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let, me, let me say something to, to uh, this question about... Uh, 
you know, Americanization of Chinese food or, or what have you, in addition to what Brian said, Brian's yeah. absolutely correct. Uh, we're seeing a, a real change happening in that right now yeah. where uh, more and more in, in American cities, there are restaurants that serve food that is indistinguishable from what you would get in China. I mean, that is just truly, truly authentic. And now the reason for that, that's being driven by, I mean, a couple of factors, but primarily it's because we have uh, long, uh, you know, sort of to do people doing long sojourns in the U.S., either in school or, or whatever, who are from China. We have 350, we had until recently, some 350,000 students every year matriculating in American universities. Uh, and they want yeah. to eat the food they were used to. And they realize there's a market for it. Mm -hmm. All those ingredients, yeah. thanks to globalization, are available. There's nothing stopping you from being able to create truly authentic Chinese food anymore in, in America. Yeah. And Americans are finding that it's just much better. And it is, it's just, it's, I mean, it's just orders of magnitude better. Now, I, I, I like Americanized Chinese food just as a separate cuisine. Mm, I mean, sure. it, if it's not apples, I mean, it's not apples to apples. It's, it's, it's on its own terms, you know, there are, there are perfectly fine dishes. Uh, and um, even my wife, you know, who's a native of Beijing, she, she likes that stuff occasionally as well. Um, yeah. But man, there is a sea change. And if you go to any U.S. city where there's a large Chinese population right now, you can find stuff that is every bit. This, yeah. It's just just like you would in Beijing, Shanghai, Chengdu, or what have you. Globalization. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm ready for dinner. It's dinner time where I am. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you've whetted uh, everybody's appetite. This has been absolutely fascinating. Really, really fascinating. Brian, congratulations on the book. Um, I think it is definitely a great read, and I would encourage everybody to get it uh, and read it. And I think um, uh, we've shared with the audience members uh, ways in which they can get it um, electronically or otherwise uh, through Columbia University Press. Kaiser, um, this is great. This is fantastic. I hope that we get to do many more podcasts with you. Um, <laughs> thank you for doing this. My and, pleasure. Yeah. And thank you at Columbia University Press to Jennifer Crew, um, the head of the press who had a particular interest uh, in this book, um, as you probably know, Brian, and Eric Schwartz and Meredith Howard. Uh, Want to echo um, Kaiser's uh, thanks to her. And thanks to our audience um, tuning in from all over the world. Um, sorry we didn't get to all of your questions, but we got to uh, a good number of them. So this was fabulous. Thank you very much. Uh, bon appétit. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. So fun.